All righty. Thank you all for coming. I'm Summer. I'm the curator here at the museum. Before we get started, everybody, please take a second to turn off or silence your phones so we don't have any disruptions. Um, so our main announcement is we have been working with the city and Peck Alumni Association for about a year um, to create a permanent exhibit about the history of Peck High School. Um, and it will be opening at the Peck Center. So the grand opening will be on August 13th. It will be open to the public from 2 to 5. So we hope to see you all there for that. Um, and then our upcoming programs here. Our August 3rd on 3rd on the 19th will be with Calvin Bryant, who will speak about Jean Ribot, one of the early French settlers here. And then our September Brown Bag Lunch, Brown Bag Lunch on September 7th will be with Rebecca Dominguez Carini, who will speak about the oral history project she's been undertaking to collect stories from Northeast Florida's Hispanic residents. <laughs> Um, so that's it for announcements, but today we have Dr. Taylor Clem, a graduate of University of Florida in University of Kentucky. Dr. Clem has two degrees in landscape architecture and a doctorate in horticultural sciences. He has worked as a graduate student for U.S. Center for Landscape Conservation and Ecology with experience in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, Landscape Design, and Behavior Change. Dr. Clem is now serving as Nassau County's Horticulture Extension Agent, County Extension Director, and Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator. So everyone please welcome Taylor Clem. Well, good afternoon everybody. Um, my name is Taylor Clem, and you know, I always love coming and doing some public presentations, community presentations like this, and it's awesome that I'm actually seeing a lot of familiar faces, so um, hello. Um, but today's program, I'm calling Becoming a Lazy Gardener. Yay. Yes. <laughs> so, and you know, the, this kind of started from, I started using the term lazy gardener because it's like, you know, when you look at your landscape and you're looking at your garden, your goal isn't to look at all your to-dos, right? Like, you don't want your garden to be like you walk in and you're like, I got to pull weeds, I got to fertilize this, I got to water that, you know? You want your garden to be something that you enjoy more and work less. You know, usually, you know, when I'm helping do designs for communities or I've helped with homeowners, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of project I'm designing. The big key takeaway from every single project, when you ask clients, what do you want to achieve in your garden? You know what the two things they always say are? I want it to look good and I want it to be low maintenance. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the projects can end up looking like, but those are always the top two things. It doesn't matter. So I want to, I started using this term, like I want to be a lazy gardener because I want to go out into my landscape, my garden. I want to hang out with my boys. I want to be able to, um, you know, relax in it. Spend more time relaxing. So if I think about, okay, how do we minimize our efforts into our gardens? And that's essentially how, like, this stemmed from a, uh, a gardening article I wrote a few months ago and, you know, building a program out of it, too. So it makes it, it, makes it fun. It kind of makes a whole full circle. But whenever I teach any type of program, I always like to have these essential questions. These essential questions essentially are, by the time we finish speaking um, today, you should be able to comfortably answer a couple of these two questions. So we'll, we'll wrap back around to these at the end, nonetheless. So these essential questions are, what are planning strategies for preparing our landscapes? Preparing. And then how do we overlove our landscapes? So it's like, overloving? Taylor, what does that mean? <laughs> so we'll talk a lot about that. But ultimately, it comes down to... Ah, there we go. Preparing and planning. And then maintenance. Or that term I use, overloving. So when I think about how do we become a lazy lazy gardener, there's a lot of preparation that takes that goes into creating a landscape that allows you to not have to work as much as you should. Uh, but also maintenance. Some of the big issues that we have when people call our office, 
you know, they speak with the Master Gardener volunteers. They say, hey, here's some issues that are happening in my landscape. Nine times out of ten, maybe like 99% of the time, it relates to just overloving the landscape. You know, great question I want to ask you all is if your plant doesn't look well, what do you do? Water it. Water it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, majority of the times, a lot of the issues that we have in our landscape is related to overwatering. So as a response to seeing a plant that is being stressed from overwatering, if you overwater it, that's going to make the problem worse. Same thing is, another thing people will say is I fertilized it. Fertilizer can create excess of growth, which then brings in more pests and disease and makes your plants more susceptible to damage. So essentially, you're doing a lot of effort when sometimes the best thing to do is do nothing, allow you to become a lazy gardener. So we think about this from the perspective of um, how can we prepare and plan properly and maintain our landscapes properly so we can enjoy more and work less. And that kind of like starts to fall into this, what is a sustainable landscape? So a sustainable landscape is a landscape that both has its social, economic, and environmental benefits. So a social benefit would be something like, it looks good, the neighbors like it. You know, I like it, it's fun. Uh, environmental benefits would be, you have an, a landscape that brings in pollinators, you know, habitat for different wildlife. It can be something that is like, I'm using a lot less water in my landscape to help maintain it. And then the economic could be, Benefits of like, oh, I put less inputs in, that saves me money, you know. Um, so this actually, this mentality kind of drives us to these sustainable landscapes. So becoming a lazy gardener can have these social, economic, and environmental benefits, which is super handy. But if we look at it from the improper planning or improper maintenance, we have too much work and inputs. Too much goes into it. And then that leads to unsustainable landscapes such as insect pressure, disease pressure, fungal pressures, just all the problems that can pop up in your landscape. So usually that can be an indicator. It's like, okay, if I'm having all of these issues pop up in my landscape, can I do something? What, what do I need to change? Because if we typically can just correct the management for a lot of those plants, it gets rid of the problem. So like a great example is a fungus. So if we have fungal issues with our plants, how many of you have had like a fungus issue on plants before? Yeah, you know, it's common. It's, it's so common. So um, if we have a fungus issue, well, yeah, we can put a fungicide on it, cool. But what's causing it, that fungus to be there in the first place? You know, if we don't correct that, that fungus problem keeps coming back, right? So, so that's kind of like the roadmap, what we're gonna think about. But it's important that when we think about our landscapes, I always like to say, like, what are some ways that our poor landscape management or unsustainable landscape management, how does it impact Florida? What are some of those things that you think about? I ask questions. I ask you all questions during my, when I speak. Too much nitrogen. Too much nitrogen. But what does that what what, what does that lead to? Your algae blooms. Algal blooms. Yeah, yeah. Our landscapes are contributors of that. Nitrogen and phosphorus. Those big two, first two numbers on our fertilizer bags. You know, there's like three big numbers on our fertilizer bags. NPK, nitrogen, and phosphorus are big contributors to algal blooms. And phosphorus, there's never a reason to apply that in Florida because we have so much phosphorus in our soils that pretty much if you apply any, you're losing all of that and it's going right into our water bodies. So, what were some other ways? What about can... bringing in non-natives? Non-natives? It depends. So with wildlife and habitat fragmentation, having a native plant species can help reconnect fragmented landscapes where the non-native plants do not have a capacity to completely do so. Um, now, of course, invasive species, that's a whole other area. No invasive species at all. So, so invasive take over, obviously, but I thought they were mostly non-native. All invasive species are non-native. But not all non-native species are invasive. So an invasive species, yeah, very good question. An invasive species is a specific plant, they're going to be non-native, that come into the landscape and they displace our natural areas, destroy those natural areas. Where there's a lot of non-native plants that grow that we use ornamentally that do not do that. Um, and they have value, especially if we, we have highly disturbed landscapes. Sometimes those non-natives will actually establish and do better 
than the native wood. But if we have a natural area that we are ba we're able to get some of those native plants established, then that has higher value. But a great question. So there are nuisances that are native species, but they're not invasive. Okay. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Who's beyond our control? Too much water? Yeah. And rain, which we've been having. Yeah. So, I mean, a great thing, and we'll talk about this, is our prime growing season for our landscapes is wind. The growing season. It's, it's, it's our spring now. And conveniently, what happens this time of year? Rain. It's our rainy season. So, it's actually, it's rare, honestly, that you should be irrigating your landscapes at all. University of Florida, our recommendation is to turn your irrigation system completely off. Don't even run it, and I'll talk about that more. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to get too far ahead, but those are really good things because when we think about poor landscape management, we're always concerned about pollutants. You know, how does our decisions and behaviors impact um, our landscapes? You know, our water bodies. You know, we love Florida. We, Florida's natural environment is amazing. You know, so we don't want to do anything that would hurt that. And then also the overuse of water, you know, through improper management, that depletes our natural recharge areas. And like aquifer decline, you know, we're having less stream flow or more stream flow from uh, flooding occurrences. But anyways, so we're always concerned about water quality and quantity with our landscapes. And, you know, when we talk about that quantity, we do know that approximately 60% of homeowner water usage is attributed to landscape irrigation. That's a lot. That's a lot. That is a lot. It's actually like 59.6, like but we just say 60. Um, but still, that's a lot of water because we do know that when we compare some landscapes that are following our best management practices compared to like a traditional landscape, that you're reducing your water consumption by 85%. I mean, that's a significant yeah, amount. And that's purely just because of establishment period, because a lot of our landscapes, you just turn the system off and only irrigate when needed. And the reason we think about that is because here's the state of Florida in 2005. That red is the developed areas, you know? Uh, but we know the population is going to double by 2060. We actually have 1,000 people coming into the state every, day. every single day. That's a lot of people. We're actually exceeding these projections, and this is what Florida is supposed to look like by 2060 with those development patterns, which is significant. So that makes us think more about, like, how are we maintaining our yards? Because it becomes that much more important. Because we're thinking about how do we make sure we conserve Florida for all of our benefits. Um, so that's why we have a statewide program. It's called the Florida Free Landscaping Program. And that's where a lot of these like lazy gardener behaviors kind of emerge. So the Florida Free Landscaping Program, how many of you have heard of this program before? Cool. So this FFL program, which for short, this is our statewide program. It's even written in state statute, which is kind of neat. Um, but essentially, it is a way that we just think about managing our landscapes sustainably to think about how can we conserve water, protect water quality, and enhance and protect biodiversity. And we do this by following these nine principles. And we have programs and resources all the time. All my horticulture programs always fall back to, towards this FFL program. Uh, but ultimately, these nine principles outline a way for us to be lazy gardeners. We have right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pests, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff, and protect the waterfront. But when we're talking about preparing and planning, our landscapes, you all know the term right plant, right place? Yeah, you know, I grew up I grew up watching this old house, and they say that all the time. Right plant, right place, I even think they say it in the intro of the show. Um, but that's where our, really a big part of our planning and preparing comes in. Because if we select the right plant for the right place, that plant does so well. It establishes in the landscape, it's like, hey, I'm happy, I'm healthy, bring on the world, and they will grow and thrive. It's when we start to put the wrong plant in the wrong place, and tr yeah, it's like you're trying, to, you're trying to force a square peg in a round hole type of thing, you know, and when you're trying to plant something that's the wrong plant in the wrong place, there's a really good chance that that plant's going to end up being stressed. It's not going to do well. And when that happens, it's more susceptible to disease, fungus, 
pest, you name it. So if you start with right plant, right place, and you're just thinking about what plant should I put in my landscape, you're already maybe starting yourself off for success, which is a really, really wonderful part of that Propel program. Yes, ma'am. One of the things that I use to apply that is yeah. that if Mother Nature plants something voluntarily in a space that I see that it can grow and be okay in my landscape, I leave it alone and let it go. Absolutely. Like one of the things that I really like to do is there's this website called Plant Real Florida. It's part of the Florida Native Plant Society where it's like, oh, here's these natural ecosystems that are surround me. What are those plants that actually make up that natural ecosystem, like the maritime forest, you know, pine flatwoods, whatever it might be, and it's like all of a sudden that's a plant list that you know is going to do well here, per se. So, so the right plant, right place, that's that very beginning. And some of these things that we need to think about is how we select plants that match the function or the space that's going to grow. So, you know, some of these things that we consider are like the size. How big does a plant get? You know? It's like plants don't like, you know, plants aren't like, you know, you go get your haircut. You go get your haircut. It's, you know, even if it's a bad haircut, it's not the end of the world, you know? But every time you prune a plant, that's stress. You know, there's times you can go into selective pruning, totally fine. But if you get hedge clippers and, you know, you're constantly doing that to keep it at a certain box, that's a lot of stress. So that plant is more susceptible to damage. So... Rather than putting these tall trees in front of these, or shrubs in front of these windows, which is a bad safety ideal also, why not just pick a shrub that stays like three feet by four feet and call it a day, you know? <laughs> Periodically, you'll have a branch that shoots out, but that's really easy to go out with a pruning shears and just click that off. But um, So you always think about size. How big does a plant get at its mature size? Don't just plant that based off of how it looks in that container at the nursery. Because I always like to tell people, plants do this magical thing called grow. <laughs> <laughs> so you go in a landscape, it gets established, it's going to grow. So knowing that mature size and how big it's going to get is going to really help you out. Because that's a lot less, because I don't like going out and pruning and clipping and all that stuff unless I have to. So if I think about that size of a plant is going to work well. Mm -hmm. So the next is function. So function is how is your landscape going to be used? What's the goals of the landscape? So like I mentioned that I got, I have two boys and they're all over the place. And um, so when I think about like my backyard, yes, I need turf grass because I have the right environmental conditions for it, but that is more resilient to the boys running around. But if I have like, you know, like other ground covers that I really like, like uh, jasmines, et cetera, they can't withstand my boys running around and get torn up. Um, and it'll actually in, impact our soil and our, as well as water quality when we have exposed, um, that exposed soil nonetheless. But anyways, so function, what's the purpose of your landscape? What's it going to do? Sometimes that's really easy. It's kind of negligible because, you know, high activity versus something that's going to be quiet versus I want a pollinator garden versus a rain garden. So you're starting to think about how that function can end up select, help in, um, influencing your, your decisions. But size and function is important, but ultimately sunshade conditions. Some plants like full shade, others like full sun. Don't put a plant that loves full shade, full shade in full sun and vice versa. It doesn't work. Um, you know, soil moisture. Some plants love a lot of moisture, others do not. So if you have well-drained soils, don't put something in that needs a lot of moisture because you're gonna have to irrigate it all the time. It's just gonna dry out. It's not worth the effort. Um, and climate conditions. So that's like our hardiness zone. So, um, ah, I have a map. So like on essentially the east side of the county, you're 9A. On the west side of the county, you're 8B. So that's our based off of our minimal, like our average cold temperatures um, in the middle of the winter. So we have plants that generally do, I mean, they do amazing here. But I know, like, when I first moved to Florida, I thought Florida was a land of palm trees, you know. <laughs> and I moved to North Florida. So I moved to St. Johns County in 2000 originally. And no, far from. It was pine trees and palmettos. I mean, there was cabbage palms. And there are some cold tolerant palms. But, you know, it's not South Beach. Um, and that's kind of what I expected, but I'm not the only one that thinks that. So I see a lot of plants are like, we want tropical plants, we bring them in. And we had that hard freeze this past winter, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a reawakening for yeah. some people's plants. Now, of course, it's fun to have little <laughs> accent plants here and there that you can put in containers, you protect them, etc. But knowing our climate conditions, because plants have their limits. And if we plant outside that climate condition, they're not going to be happy in the landscape. Salt tolerance. Obviously, if you're on the west side of the county, you can plant whatever you want when it comes to salt tolerance. Now, if you're living here on Amelia Island or close, closer to any, like the brackish water, the ocean, you need to think about salt tolerance. Plants have certain levels of salt tolerance, high tolerance and low tolerance, um, and salt can kill plants quicker than you can blink an eye at. You know, so knowing salt tolerance is going to be important because if you have constant salt tolerance or the salt the impact on plants, that's going to make that plant weaker and it eventually will kill it. Yes, ma'am. So we have the hardiness zone. What about humidity? Is there a zone or a chart for that? No, there's no chart for humidity. Just Florida's humid. So all of a sudden we think about circulation. One of the big things that we see, at least with humidity, is plants, we're not thinking about the size that they get, so they're put too close together. So there's no, there's not enough good, there's not enough air circulation around plants. So when you don't have good circulation and that high humidity, fungus. So making sure that we're spacing our plants based off of their mature size too is going to be very important. But there are some plants that just don't tolerate humidity. Right. There are, usually the humidity is not going to be a problem as long as there's circulation. Yeah, if there's lack of circulation, that's when you're going to have more plants more susceptible to damage as a result of that humidity. So, so here's an example. Here's a palm. This is a palm suffering from uh, salt damage. So, as you can see, not all palms are salt tolerant. <laughs> so... And also drought tolerance. Uh, do plants yeah, have drought tolerance? drought tolerance? Yeah, that's an important thing to think about. So, okay, so that's part of the planning. Is like you need to think about what types of plants that we want, or that right plant, right place. You know. Then also, okay, so now you need to start thinking about how do we plan and select the most appropriate plants. What I always say is go map your yard. You know, you all probably know this part of my yard has these types of conditions. This yard has these types of conditions. I, you know, if you're not sure. Just draw a picture of your property and do what we call an inventory and just take notes of what are those different conditions in those different parts of your yard. And remember, seasons change. You know, you may have full sun in the summer, but you may have shade in the winter because the sun's sitting a little bit lower. So those are always things you need to think about that seasonality too. Um, so just map your yard. You don't have to do this, but this is a handy tool. But then it's like, okay, I've learned all these conditions, but how do I know which plants I can use or which plants I should use? That's the hardest thing. But the nice thing is with this information, you can easily go to the plant nursery and you can walk around and you can start looking at those plant tags. You know, try to get a general information of like how will those work in those locations. But we do have multiple plant selection apps online. So like with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, we have our FFL plant guide. It's a, you can get it as an app on your phone. You can go right onto the, the, your internet browser and you can pull it up. And all you do is you start selecting, um, you get a screenshot, you just start selecting the types of conditions. So as a like plant type, sun level, hardiness zone, salt tolerance, do you want native? Um, so you just kind of like check all those boxes and then boink, it'll start pulling out Florida, what we call Florida friendly plants. But these plants are pretty much all, the ones that are on this list are typically going to be commercially available. Some other websites you can go to are really, really handy, but it's going to be really, really tough to find some of those plants. But this is a great way to start selecting some really cool plants and you can start figuring out what plants you would like to use in your landscape. So get a little bit better preparation. Um, and a neat thing is um, you can click on each one of these plants and it'll go into more detail about that specific plant. The size, um, the shape, the leaf color, the fall color, flower color, and like some other info so you can get more details about it. But also, no invasives. Excuse me. So, me. so the plant guide, those unless you get, is that for all of Florida, or is there a way to tell what's going to grow in Northeast Florida versus South? Yep. Yeah. So, as part of this, this asks for your hardiness zone. Okay. So, it'll filter that out. But also, when you jump into that webpage for the first time, it may ask you 
what is your zip code, uh, okay. and it'll try to automatically just filter out everything. Great. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. great question. Great question. That doesn't necessarily work for zip code though. Because I, my zip code is Fernandina, but I live off island. Right. And it's a totally different. Yeah. Well, and the nice thing is, but that's just more for the climate conditions. So once you're actually in still that filter, you'll select like your salt tolerance and water requirements. And then, but it, it's going to immediately eliminate all the plants that literally cannot grow in this environment. So, because you can actually just pull up all the plants. So. And then the next thing is just no invasive, no invasive species at all. So you can go on to, we have the IFAS assessment webpage, and you can just type in any plant that you're questioning, and it'll tell you if it is invasive or not. You know, some of the most common plants that we see that are invasive that like you buy at big box stores, like tuberous sword fern, that's everywhere. Um, there's some invasive lantana species, that's everywhere, and you can buy that at the store, you know. So there's there's a lot. Mexican petunia, that's a super common one. Even the sterile varieties, I'd be very careful with. Um, so, you know, it's, it's nice and it, because if you're going through the FFL uh, list, it's going to, it's not going to have any invasive species on there. Because one, if anything's listed as an invasive species, it's automatically removed from this list. So it's updated as information is updated. And one really sad thing is, as of just like two months ago, Liriope, invasive. Yeah, I know. Heartbreaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. What, what class level? Because you know you have Flexi that does class yeah. one, class two, class three. So this is considered, in the, the Liriope was given invasive. Uh -huh. We have some other plants that, like even the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, if it's considered high invasion risk, we don't we don't recommend people planting yet. So, um, but that really comes down to you can get your yard recognized as a Florida Friendly Landscape, and you can get the minimum recognition with some of those in basic invasive plants in like but it has to be like the actually the noxious weeds like asparagus air potato um, asparagus fern yeah. because you're trying to remove them but they keep coming back in yeah. <laughs> so um, but anyways yeah. so you can always check if something's invasive if it's in doubt you can always just reach out to our office we can help figure that out for you yes sir moving into a, uh, a new community normally they put stuff in yeah, that's a good term to put it, just stuff. Yeah. <laughs> How much research was done by the guy that put it in? But, I mean, it's, it's pretty quick. Minimum to, yeah, so how much work goes into that plant selection for new developments? Yeah. Minimum. So, because it's the code, the meet code requirements, and code requirements are minimum. Um, so, Usually, because of how many homes that they're doing, they go to whoever wholesaler they can get all those plants from. Yeah. Now, you know, it's really cool that like the home that I ended up moving into, they actually have a really nice plant palette, but they planted them too close together. They're too close to the house. You know, they're not thinking about. It's like an instant gratification. Like you throw plants in yeah. super close, it looks really nice. Yeah. But oh lord, five years down the road. Oh, yeah. So this October, a lot of that's going. Um, yeah. But anyways, so but curb appeal. Yeah, curb appeal. And sometimes some of those people making those plant decisions with some of those developers may not even be from this area. They could be from halfway across the United States. Mm -hmm. so they're making that decision off of minimum F yeah, minimum knowledge. Minimum. One of the things with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, it's for residential programming. We also have commercial programming. So people that need licensing, like your Moblo Go Guys fertilizers, okay. we have specific programs that they have to go through to maintain their licensing. As well, we're developing programs mm -hmm. right now for developers and builders. So it's because wow. we know that that's a, that's a missing piece of our puzzle. So yeah, it's a key part. But anyways, so we talked about planning and preparing. I gotta make sure we stay on track, you know. Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> planning and preparing. If you start with right plant, right place, you think about those considerations. You know, even if you're stuck with a new landscape that you had no decision in, it'll gives you the tool to think: How do I start making these changes? You know, do I, as things phase out, what do, what, it, it gives you those tools to prepare, those little nuggets, those like little changes that you can make over time. So that's the preparing and planning. 
So, like, you did it. You know, woo! You plan for a more sustainable landscape that will require less work. Because if you just start planning now, there's a lot less work that goes inside it. Inside it. But now what? So, that's where it starts thinking about maintaining. Because, yes, no matter how hard you try, you're still going to have to maintain it. Regardless, there's no zero maintenance landscape unless you live in the wilderness which would actually be kind of cool. But um, <laughs> but anyways, for like your typical residential areas, you're, if you have a landscape, a yard, it's going to have to be maintained in some capacity. So this comes back to the question we, earlier I said, if your landscape is looking bad, what do you do? And that's when you all mentioned, oh, yeah, it's like a water. You know, it looks bad, I'll put water down, it looks stressed. You know, or I'll put down some nutrients. I'll put down some pesticides, but actually, these are what I call the landscaping faux pas, um, because these are a result, a lot of the problems that we have in our landscapes results from that over-loving our landscape, it's part of that maintaining our landscapes. So when we put too much water, excessive nutrients down, like fertilizers, uh, or we're using too much pesticides, then what ends up happening is it leads to a weaker, less resilient, less protected plants. And those are just, the just results in just stressed plants overall. And when that happens, I always like to joke, it's like you might as well have a big neon sign flashing like all you can eat buffet over your plants. Because insects know, the pests know, that if all of a sudden there's like, I see a stressed plant, bam, that's where they're going to be. Because guess what, if you have seen Augustine grass, you're always going to have chinch bugs. They're always going to be there. So, you know, if someone comes knocking your door and say you have chinch bugs, you need to spray. No, you know, you're always, you're always going to have chinch bugs, but it's just a matter of, are they problematic? Because if you have a healthy turf grass stand, chinch bug problem is not going to get to that population threshold where it becomes a problem. You know, same thing is like, you know, but if you maintain those plants correctly, not just turf grass, all plants, then the plants are going to be less stressed. They're going to be happy, healthy, they'll be resilient, they'll be able to withstand a lot of pressure, so that requires less inputs from you. I saw two hands. You first? Um, are we going to do lawn at all, or is it just plants? This is kind of, uh, this all relates to the same. So this, all these, all these this talking points is both ornamental plants and lawn. Same rules apply. So... But at the end, we can have. Okay. So we can we can do uh, specific questions at the end for, okay, for lawn. Sure. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Maybe this should wait till the end. Um, fertilizer, what kind and when? Uh, we've heard so many things in the garden. It well. depends on the plant. Yeah. So we can talk specific. We'll do specific questions at the end for fertilizers, nutrients. Yeah. So but ultimately, a stressed plant is an unhappy plant. So an unhappy plant attracts all pests and all the damage and everything. And that relates typically for overwatering, over fertilizing, over using excessive pesticides. That's where we're seeing those problems really pop up and really flourish. So talking about watering and irrigation. So irrigation systems are a tool when rainfall isn't adequate. There's a lot of times when like there's you know people hate the idea of irrigation systems. And it's like, I get it. It's not the irrigation system's fault, though. It's a behavior problem. And that's because people overwater. You know, of course, yeah, you can go out with a hose, no problem, and it's not a big deal. But think about an irrigation system as a tool. When, when rainfall is not adequate and your plants are showing signs of stress, drought stress, that's when your irrigation system can be handy because it's an easy way to deliver water to your landscape. Properly selected plants can go a long, like shrubs can go a long, 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 long time without a, a drop of water, whether it be from rainfall or irrigation. Now, turf grass in the middle of the summer will go about five days without a drop of water on it. And our max that you can irrigate through the St. John's River Water Management District is twice a week. And that still exceeds our recommendation. Our recommendation is turn your system off completely. Yeah, you said for the whole season? Well, just no, always. Just keep your irrigation oh, completely no. system, com completely off and only turn it on and use it if there's not enough rainfall. Oh. Your plants are showing drought stress. So, um, and every time you do apply, you need, it's not a time that you apply, it's an amount. You want to put down a half inch to three quarters of an inch, whether you're coming out with a hose 
and putting that down, or if you're running your irrigation system. Um, some trees, you're going to probably want to add like two gallons per inch of caliper, but usually that half inch to three quarter of an inch per application is the ideal range. So if you're not sure how much water that is or how long to run your system, how many of your cat owners? You have cat food cans? Yeah. Or tuna cans? <laughs> those, you know, I mean, yeah. But those cans are wonderful. You just put those out in your, land, your yard, you run your system for 10 minutes, and you see how much water fills up those cans, and then you adjust your system accordingly to make sure you're getting that half to three quarter inch. So it's, you're just putting out weight. We call it a, cap, a catch can test. And we actually recommend people do that annually as part of maintenance for irrigation systems. But also ultimately, keep your system off. Only apply when plants show signs of drought stress. Max twice a week. Or you can always just hand water as needed for certain plants. It's like, hey, that plant is drought stressed. Should I run my entire system for that? No, just get a hose. <laughs> it works out, and the plant will be a happy camper. Because what ends up happening, if we overwater our plants, both turf grass and our shrubs, our ornamentals, if we're watering it too much, it's like you're feeding your child candy all the time. The roots get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter on those plants. And it makes that plant less resilient. Because it's not having to try as hard. You know, it's like, ah, the water's right there, and actually you're actually making the roots rot. But um, it's not going to try as hard. But if you push those plants to the edge of drought, what do you think is going to happen? Roots go deeper. Roots go deeper. They go looking. Yeah. So all of a sudden, drought happens. No rain. you got deep roots. And your plants are able to grab as much moisture as they can. Mm -hmm. More resilient. You make your roots, your roots happy, your plants are happy. So irrigation, <clears throat> huge problems that we have within our turf grass and our ornamentals is fungus. And that is brought on by irrigation. Define turf grass. Turf grass, yeah. just like St. Augustine, zoysia grass, yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so nutrition and fertilizer. Always follow UF IFAS recommendations for turf grass. So it depends on the species. But like St. Augustine grass, you can get by with just two applications of fertilizer throughout the growing season. Bahia grass and centipede, bahia grass and centipede can get by with one application throughout the year. You know, some might require more, like Bermuda needs a little bit more. Um, but follow our IFAS recommendations because those are based off of our research that we've been running continuously for like 35 years on nutrient uptake efficiency. Um, fertilize only if you see signs of nutrient deficiencies. So nutrient deficiencies is typically like your leaves are going to start discoloring in really weird ways. And it's typically like symmetrical patterns that you see. Um, and you know you can always reach out to us like, hey, here's my leaves. What's, what am I deficient in? Or you know, we see it all the time in citrus and palms. Palms are always nutrition, like potassium specifically. They're always deficient in something. Um, and citrus as well because they're high consumers of nutrients in order to produce the fruit. So, but most of our other shrubs and landscape plants that we have in our landscape seldomly show nutrition deficiencies. Um, but there are ways to make sure you're fertilizing to make sure they stay healthy for, not necessarily healthy, but to make them high, your quality plants. Like a good example is a rose. You know, there's a lot of work that can go into a rose if you want to make it a high quality rose. But improper fertilization, fertilizer leads to salt accumulation in your soil. Did you know that? No. Yeah, salts accumulate from fertilizer use. No, so yeah. if, we, if we go back in the history, like probably within like the past three millennia, when we were doing some like early fertilizer usage, we actually lost, like globally, it was like in the rural crescent area, they lost tremendous amounts of agri agricultural land because of over types of fertilizer and salt accumulation made those fields unusable. So salt, uh, fertilizer can bring salt, bring salt into your landscape. So if you're using too much fertilizer, you're going to have excess of salt come in, and that can impact your plants. It can create excessive growth. That excessive growth actually is weak growth, and it's it's more susceptible to damage and other issues. Um, It'll increase pest damage because of that excessive growth. You're, that's going to be a magnet for those uh, insects. Um, and also shrinking roots, because a lot of those for over fertilizer usage, same thing. It's going to cause those roots to shrink a little bit more. 
So if you follow those recommendations or you just fertilize as appropriately, you, you only when needed, those roots get deeper. They grow in the landscape. So, and then obviously pollution. This is St. John's River. I used to, when I was growing up, I used to swim in the St. John's River. I don't anymore. <laughs> um, I actually saw algal bloom alert for Doctors Inlet, which is over Orange Park area recently, like maybe just three days ago, I think. So, you know, when we see things like this, it's not just unsightly, but it kills fish, it kills a lot of our aquatic species, and um, it can actually, people have died from coming in contact with this, just inhaling it. You know, if you're around it, it can make you sick. So this stuff is unbelievably dangerous. You know, we'll always have green algae. Like, we'll always have chinch bugs. But with the excess of nutrients, that makes it grow beyond a threshold that's healthy or safe. It takes it way too far. So soil test, that's what we always recommend, is do a soil test before fertilizing. So you can bring soil samples to our office to do pH tests. Or um, we actually have our labs on UF's campus that they'll give you pH, uh, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, manganese, boron. They'll give you a whole uh, list of recommendations. They do a full analysis on your soil. We don't have the capacity to do that because it requires a big lab. But we can do a pH tests. And pH can impact how well your plants uptake nutrients. Because if your pH is off, you can put down as much fertilizer as you want, but your plants won't uptake it. So, question here first. Uh, what about venting your um, the top of your grass? Because I noticed the St. Augustine is runners, and mm -hmm. sometimes they're not underground, and a lot of people are putting like soil on them, and they seem to come back. So that's a very good question about soil mints for turf grass. So for St. Augustine grass, those stolons are supposed to be on top of the ground. They're not supposed to be underground. No. We do have some that have rhizomes that stay underground, but the stolons of St. Augustine are supposed to be above the surface. Um, we are doing some research about compost amendments with turf grass mm -hmm. to see how that works in a landscape. And it's some really, really cool results about building turf grass health because you're bringing yeah. organic matter in. And that organic matter helps with hold on to those nutrients, it helps with the soil moisture content. Because of our, you know, if you're on the island, you usually have a pH, high pH, uh, because of the sand and shells, etc. cetera. Uh, but it helps buffer that soil, allow for nutrient uptake, it helps hold on to those nutrients and that moisture much better. Organic material in your soil is the most important part of the landscape. But so um, layering with on top, those runners you layer? So they're not necessarily, um, so what they're doing as part of top dressing that is they actually aerate. So they're creating all those little holes, and then they come back and just spread compost over it. Uh, so I know the runner that we were talking. Oh, about. the runners. Yeah, they just stay on the surface. Well, it's coming over to my concrete, so I want more with bare spots. Mm -hmm. you can yeah, you can redirect them, or you can just cut it and just plant, plant it. Under, a plant. Okay. Yeah. I'm sticking it underneath one of the other. Okay. Yeah, because what you'll you notice is with that St. Augustine grass specifically, um, it'll shoot out the roots at each one of those little nodes along that uh, stolen. So if you just transplant that that little runner that's stolen and it has those roots, it should yeah, it should take. Plant. You just can't shove it up in there. If, you can redirect it and get it there, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyways, soil, soil testing is going to be key. Soil test before you do any type of fertilizer because it's not going to be worth it to you to put down any nutrients and are not needed. You know, because anything you put down is lost. It's not needed as an input. So don't just put something down to put something down, especially when it's not needed. So you can always do a soil test to determine, but the great thing at least about the ornamental plants is they'll just tell you when they need it, really. You don't need to fertilize ornamental trees. I know people ask me about that, like no, because those root systems are so large that more than likely they're underneath your turf grass areas that you might be fertilizing anyways, that they're picking up nutrients from all over the place. So, um, you know, don't bag your clippings. Just let them lie. That breaks down and takes those nutrients back into the soil. So I think you have one question. Yeah, mine is about your commercial, you know, like your bug out, your true greens, your mm -hmm. whatever. The question my husband and I have going back and forth because I'm sure, like, we don't need to do a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, does Florida have uh, any criteria for, like, when you have your long companies servicing 
every month doing whatever about how much they can fertilize or things that they can put down. Because it seems like when I look at the thing, it says, well, we're treating today, we're fertilizing, we're doing for bugs, we're doing for this, and I'm going, every month you're doing that? Yeah. So there, there is nothing in state statute that requires how they apply it. But what we recommend is still those best management practices. So I know there are some contractors that do amazing with it, and others it's really about as an informed consumer, how can we make sure that we're asking those right questions of anybody that we hire to make sure that they're following those best management practices because sometimes those inputs create the problems that then some of those companies have to come back yeah. and fix. Yeah. So self-serving so sometimes, yeah. but not always, not always, of course. So that's really important about like what are those correct questions? And we actually have a publication with the University of Florida about like how homeowners can work with those contractors or those companies oh, that good. ask those right questions. So, the pesticide usage, because we have companies that come in and just put down pesticide use. So, we always recommend integrated pest management. You're always going to have bugs. You will never have a bug free lawn. How many of the insects in your yard, like percent wise, or in Florida, how many are percent wise, how many are considered a pest? None. Ballpark some numbers. There's, there's some. Okay. None, none, none. Approach, approach. But <laughs> good try though. Ten percent. Fire ants. Fire ants. Yeah. Yeah, they're invasive. Yeah. Say it again. Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Oh, yeah. But they're pollinators. But the pollen, they are pollinators. They're important yeah, pollinators. Pollinator. But what's the percentage? I had a zero percent. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Fifty. Fifty. Do it here. Right. 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 <laughs> so um, actually, zero percent is the, really close. It's like yeah, maybe like two okay. percent, maybe you know. That's like if you're pushing it. And so we've put a lot of work in our landscapes for a small percent of pests because the majority of them are beneficial. Those beneficial insects predate or eat, gobble up those bad insects. Like. Ladybug. Yeah. Ladybugs love aphids. Mm -hmm. yeah, so why yeah, treat yeah. your plants with systemic insecticides when you got yeah. insects that are going to do it? Because you put down systemics, guess what happens? So, you're killing that guy too. Yeah. You know, you kill yeah. you kill your bees, you kill your pollinators. So we really think about integrated pest management. And the best way to control pests in your landscape is just to, the first step is cultural controls. It's like, is it the right plant the right place? Am I overloving my landscape? Really? So if you're just maintaining your yard appropriately, is the right plant the right place? All of a sudden your insect pressure is going to go down dramatically. Um, and that's not just insects, but it's all pests. So fungus, pathogen, whatever it is. Um, weeds that can pop up. So I always recommend, like, scout regularly, you know, catch a problem before it becomes an issue. So if you walk around your landscape, you're like, oh, there's you know, like, I, you've probably seen it before, there's the aphids are like mealy bugs on a plant, you know? You know what I do? I just squish yeah, them, you, you know? I think one of the, like, the most effective uh, pest control devices that you have is your shoe. You know, just squish them. Um, so, scout regularly, because if you notice the pest before it becomes a problem, if you could just maintain it that way, there's very little chance that you're going to ever have to use an insecticide. So what are the insecticide is last ditch effort if you're doing yeah. everything right, you can't control it manually, there's no biological control, then yes, there's time when insecticides become important because what happens is we get in a pesticide dependency, like, you know, some type of like a drug, like an addiction. So you put down a pesticide and it ends up killing the problem pest as well as the beneficials, but guess what rebounds quicker? The pest. Yeah, and if you put that same thing down again, it's not going to work as well. You're going to kill all the beneficials, but the pests are still going to be there. They start creating a, resi a tolerance, a resistance. Yeah. So then all of a sudden, it's like all your good bugs are dead, and you have like invincible pests. <laughs> um, so that's what ends up happening with that repeated pesticide application, and not just with insects. We see the same thing with weeds. You know, we can see that same thing happen with fungus and diseases, viruses. You all know about like um, penicillins because you know, like bacteria is losing its resistance, right? Uh, same thing, same exact thing. Over usage and not enough rotating of different active ingredients within our landscapes 
leads to these like super bugs. And we see it all the time. I was working with, uh, a long time ago, I was working with a, a, a landscape management company and they were applying for ch uh, insecticides for chinch bugs. They were applying the same thing for like five years in a row and like, we put it down and nothing dies. Well, duh. <laughs> and this guy was licensed, you know? <laughs> so he's like, you should know better. And all we did was like, all right, let's just start rotating your pesticides and then we can start cutting it back and we can break them off of that dependency. And that's what we did. So they immediately reduced their pesticide applica uh, applications by like a quarter. Well, if there's so. only 2% pretty much, what are the ones you really worry about? It, de it depends on the plant. Really, like chinch bugs are going to be a big one for turf grass as well as some of our fungal pathogens. Yeah. But again, if you're irrigating and fertilizing appropriately, not a problem. You know, the other big ones that we see ornamentally are going to be like aphids, scale. Like, how many of you have sago palms? Yeah. Asian cycad scale? Shoo! You get those things. You know, that's, that, that takes some work. Um, so it ultimately depends. So, like, citrus trees, the psyllid. That spreads uh, citrus green, you know. Or if you have palm trees, palm tree weevil. That can kill a palm tree just like that. Or the other one that we have, lethal bronzing, that's a disease that's killing palm trees left and right. Um, and it's being spread by an insect. And we're not sure which insect is doing it yet. So, yeah. I was out at a site yesterday. We were investigating some palm trees. And we are waiting to do a test to determine if it's palm weevil or lethal bronzing. We have lethal bronzing in Nassau County. I see it. <laughs> it's all over. Yes, ma'am. So when the bug control person comes around and sprays the inside of the house and then goes out and sprays the outside of the house, what do you think of the? You know, what are your recommendations about spraying the outside of, you know, the outside where it's you know touching your landscape? So it's a little bit. That's a, a slightly different area because that specific that specific license that that person is holding is specifically for insects that are inside and around the perimeter. They cannot spray outside of a certain perimeter, like five feet of a home. So you're usually going to have minimal impact. You know, and sometimes your home insurance companies are going to require that type of stuff as part of your termite bond. You know, so um, so they they're going to be targeting other insects. Okay. But still, some of them are good. You know, like you all may hate them, but wolf spiders. Shoo. They're wonderful. So, you know, you can keep them as pets if you wanted to. Um, fuzzy pets. Um, <laughs> but they're wonderful because they they don't they don't want you. They don't hide from you as much as possible. But sometimes you flip on the light and you see them and they scurry away. Um, but they're going after the bugs you don't want in your house. You know, so like snakes coming to homes. Yeah. You know why that snake is there? You got, bug, you got something you want to eat. He followed a mouse or a rat. <laughs> they follow something. The snake's not there because he wants to be there. He followed food. So the snake in your house is an indicator of something you don't want. Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> pesticides create a de dependency that leads to killing beneficials, and healthy plants withstand outcompete naturally managed insects, disease, weeds, and disease. Uh, did I put disease on me twice? I did. That's how important it is. Um, <laughs> so if you do, if, if you just right plant, right place, and you're managing your plants appropriately, like the, in, the overloving goes away. And you just kind of like, you get to that point where it's like, I get to enjoy my landscape more and I work less. So if, you're, if your landscape's looking back, what do you do? Think about management. Think about management. What am I doing? Because if I correct how I'm managing my landscape, that's going to fix majority, if not all, of my problems in the landscape. Everything else is typically just like, you know, a band-aid, but it's not going to stop the bleeding per se. You know, you could put a bucket underneath the leaking pipe, but it's not going to fix the leak. So if you fix what that issue is, is it a right plant, the right place? Awesome. And are you maintaining it properly? No. How we maintain it properly, that's going to help fix it. So the proper management corrects or prevents the majority of issues. So, in summation, becoming a lazy gardener really starts with preparing planning. Right plant, right place. You know, is it a happy plant? Is it going to be a happy plant in that location? Think about maintenance, overloving. Allows you to become that lazy gardener so you enjoy more, work less. Because so many of those issues that we have that come into our offices relates to that overloving of the landscape. And then that also links itself to becoming a more sustainable landscape as well. So whoever thought 
having a sustainable landscape can allow you to be lazy. So <laughs> we have some local resources like our county webpage, social media, YouTube. Um, but ultimately, oh, here's our essential question. Sorry. So what are planning strategies for preparing our landscapes? Do you feel like you can answer that one a little bit? Yeah, and then how do we overlove our landscapes? Water, fertilizer, pesticides, yeah. So anyways, running low on time, but here's my contact information. You can always reach out to me, our Master Gardener volunteer help desk. Um, we love to help troubleshoot with uh, homeowners in Nassau County, try to figure out, hey, what's happening? How can we help you? Um, because our goal is for everyone to maintain their landscapes in a Florida-friendly manner, which coincidentally, coincidentally allows us to become lazy gardeners. So, thank you all. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. 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 Specifics. Yeah. Because the humidity right now, and mm -hmm. it's typical that the grass will brown out. How do we know if it's brown patch and do we treat it with pesticides? So, it's never treat with a pesticide until you identify what the problem is. That's what Yeah. So you if you're looking for chinch bugs, no, I, well, because that, that, that would be, if that's one common issue this time of year, I always get a, get a can, like a, like a coffee can, have both ends open. You put it down on that edge of where it's good and bad, because that's where the insects are going to be that's causing the damage, and you fill it up with water. It's too coincidental. After all this water, that's going to happen. So it's the humidity and lots of water that I so then, the weather. So, so the, a lot of water can bring in the fungus or it can bring in the pest damage. So what you'd also want to look for, the stolons right now, no, wrong disease. Right now it would be take all root rot. Large patch is usually going to be in the fall. When we start to go about 80 degrees in our turf grass, large patch isn't really an issue because we don't, it's brown, too hot. Brown patch, that's what's typical now. With all well, take all root rot, GGG, that's our fungus that's attacking our grasses right now from the humidity. Check the roots. Check the roots. You'll actually your roots will start to yes. rot. And if they're rotting yes. and they're short and just nothing, you can actually put your fingers on them and kind of pull them apart. Right. And they just kind of crumble. Yes. That's take all root rot. So there's a uh, specific fungicide that you can use to try to treat that. But then you only need to apply it right where that's happening because it's not active anywhere else. If I showed it to you after going Yeah, I can take a quick look at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's it called? It's not called brown patch, it's called what? Probably? Take all root rot. Yeah. That large patch, brown patch, that is a uh, fall and a winter disease for turf grass. Take all is our common summer disease fungus for turf grass. Yeah, from the moisture. Yes, ma'am. How can you meet people using Roundup? Say that again? Using Roundup on everything. How can we prevent people from using Roundup on everything? So, you know, glyphosate is a powerful tool if used properly. And if it's not, it's... We're, I'm, I've been seeing a lot of issues because there is the misapplication of pesticides. The label is the law. If you apply it outside that label, it's you're breaking the law, and actually you can get cited and fined. Um, and the biggest thing is there's more powerful, easier ways to manage a lot of our weeds in our plants in our landscape. We've had a lot of contacts like. Nassau County, Duval's County's had it, St. John's County's have it, Baker County's have it. Some of the products that, because um, Roundup is just the, 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 the product name. The ingredient is glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And then there's another ingredient that's with it that's supposed to be like make it a little bit more powerful. Mm -hmm. So people are using that in their landscape, but that is only supposed to be used for hardscapes, and that's killing other plants. Mm -hmm. So it'll kill a whole tree if you misapply it. So that's when we go back to those IPM strategies. If you have a healthy plant, if you have a healthy landscape, it's going to outcompete a lot of those weeds. But in some situations, like torpedo grass um, or some of those other noxious weeds that are coming in, no matter what you do, sometimes that can become a tree to tr a, the best treatment. <clears throat> but not always. What about dollar weed? Dollar weed is a great native plant. It is. So it, it's, it's a native plant. And if you have dollar weed growing in your turf grass, that means you're overwatering. <laughs> dollar, weed, dollar, dollar weed loves moisture and full sun. So they have, grasses love full sun and well-drained soils. So if you have a part of your yard that even if you're not irrigating and dollar weed is still thriving, 
more than likely that's part of your rock yard is holding more moisture for that St. Augustine grass, and it's a good chance it's the wrong plant, the wrong place. Dollar weed and St. Augustine do not thrive together. They are count like um, I haven't ran my I ran my irrigation system uh, just two days ago. First time in like a month and a half. And my neighbor, not my neighbor, yeah, he has dollar weed. And it stops at our property line. <laughs> so, um, but um, but usually, but I have a part of my backyard where the dollar weed is just growing, despite me not irrigating. And just that's I've noticed that when it rains, that part of the yard just does not drain well. It holds moisture much long, doesn't hold moisture or holds moisture a lot longer. So St. Augustine's never going to thrive there until unless I do a significant amount of amendments. But I, I'm not going to do that. I'll just, let it, I'll just let it go because it's actually, you know, Dollwood's natives is actually very beneficial. So it is pretty. Yeah. I made a bottle garden out of an area because our backyard slopes down. We're in the development. When they built the house behind us, they built it higher. Mm -hmm. And so all their runoff comes down to my runoff. Yeah. And that's that area in between the two uh, storm drains. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, we can either truck in a bunch of fill, or I could turn it into a, bog, a native fog garden and leave it alone. And it, Just let it be. It, and yeah. it's given me that one, the volunteers I got with the red maples, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't plant it. Yeah, I didn't plant it. Yeah. I've gotten a lot of things I haven't planted. But Mother Nature put them, and I have a nice little wild garden back there, and I don't yeah. do anything. Yeah, I've actually worked with a community in the past where same thing, they have a big area where like all their water would, like would be uh -huh. conveying through swales. So all we did is we turned it into a conveying, it, it, we turned it into like a, a dry creek bank fog garden, so like ebb and flow. So it's like this really beautiful ribbon wow. that runs through their property now, and then all of a sudden like all that stormwater is infiltrated and goes into the soil there. It doesn't go into the stormwater system, and it's created a really cool amenity for that for that community. So, and the neighbor the neighborhood just came together, got the hollow one. There's like, let's turn it into a rain garden, you know? And it was wonderful. So, yes, ma'am. This is the third year I had key lime, and it's done really, really well. This year, it's a lot. Mm. So, um. So with key lime, just like any of our citrus, is it in container or is it in ground? In ground. Okay. So um, what I have noticed that citrus is a very high consumer of nutrients. So they're making sure that you're fertilizing the appropriate amount and the frequency is going to be very important for all citrus. And I have found that the directions on a lot of those fertilizer bags for citrus yeah. under fertilizes a lot of citrus. Oh. Yeah. So citrus gobbles up a lot of nutrients in order to be yeah. productive. So and then also about eight feet away is doing fine. Mm -hmm. fine right? How how long has that one been in the ground? Same amount. Same amount of time. So one other concern is micronutrient usage. So for citrus trees, micronutrients is always going to be yeah, you can get a liquid spray that you put on the leaves. That's going to be very beneficial for your citrus. Um, especially because of citrus greening. Is that the iron? Um, no, the, uh, iron is one, but the citrus micronutritional spray is like all the micronutrients specifically for citrus. So yeah. magnesium, manganese, boron, there's some sulfur in it, um, some iron. And we have found actually that if your tree has citrus greening, which we have all over Nassau County, the old recommendation is cut down the trees if they have citrus greening. But we don't need to do that anymore because if you, we've discovered that if we make sure we triple that amount of micronutrition that we put onto our citrus trees, allows the tree to be happy, healthy, and productive. Can you get that garden center? Oh yeah, it's very course. common. Common. Like there's a couple garden centers. I was like, you need to put this, this nutrition spray, and like that fertilizer bag next to one another <laughs> because our recommendation is buy both. Um, you need both for the citrus, you know, at minimum you need to put it on at least once a year, but because of the citrus greening, I just go ahead and say recommend it three times a year and fertilizing through the growing season, March through September. So if it's been in the ground for at least four years, it's always, I always remember three, six, nine, March, June, September. But if it's like three years, you have to do it four times in a growing season, but it before that, you know, five times, six times. So you're spoon feeding it when it's younger, but more frequent. So the older it gets, it drops down to three times a year, but you're applying like upwards of seven pounds of fertilizer per application. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah, wow. yeah. Those trees go. That's not, that's not it's, it's not what the back says. <laughs>
So you can actually look up our IPIS recommendations for citrus fertilizer, and it has a calendar on there. But you can also reach out to me, and I can just send it out. It's a it's a one of our most common publications we send out. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Citrus. How accurate do you think those apps are, where you can hold your phone up and then identify a plant and identify the problem? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so those apps are really powerful tools to help, like. I like to use some of those those plant ID apps to kind of help get me to maybe a genus, and get me closer to the ID because it's like okay, I know I kind of know where I'm looking, but the accuracy is me. Uh, they are getting improved, but the taking the ones where you're taking a photo of it and tell you what the problem is and how to fix it, don't do it. No, no, because there's there's no way you can't diagnose a plant from a photo. Now I can look at a plant and say that looks like Cercospora. But, you know, but ultimately, there's different ways that you can manage that. Is it a fungicide? Is it just you're watering it too much? Because a photo can't tell you, point your pop-up rotors away from your, your tree, <laughs> you know, or your shrubs. Um, so those apps, uh, I don't trust them. So, of course, I haven't messed with them that much, but to me, it just seems like snake oil. So, but the ID can be a handy tool to kind of get you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Do you, what do you recommend for moles? Moles? Ah, so moles, they are a red herring. That's a good way to put a mole. A mole is a red herring. Moles can actually be very beneficial because they actually aerate your soil. So they, can help, they can help with uh, soil compaction. But you know why that mole is there? Because you've got grubs. The grubs are going to be the ones that are causing the, causing the problem. So if you have a healthy grass or a healthy landscape, sometimes it just happens, the moles will go away. Because if the food, the grubs aren't there, moles. So you can, you can catch them, track them, kill them, whatever, but that doesn't fix the problem why, why they are there. So usually it's a grub problem that you're having in your landscape that needs to be addressed. So, and then they just go away. But there's actually benefits of having them there. You know, you just gotta walk on their holes, you know, to flatten it out a little bit. So. Taylor, we just have time for one more. One more question afterwards, and I think I saw a hand back actually pop. Did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question when you were talking about citrus. It sounded like you were saying the problem was um, citrus greening. Yes. And what does, how would I know if I had it on my page? Citrus greening. Um, will rear its head in multiple ways. So the most common way to tell if you have citrus greening is to look at the leaf, the discoloration of the leaf. Because citrus greening is going to have leaf discoloration. So if it is a nutrition deficiency, um, that leaf discoloration is going to be symmetrical. It's going to look the same, like if you're looking at that mid-rib going up the leaf, it's going to look the same on the left and the right. If it's asymmetrical, where the right side doesn't look like the left side at all, like the pattern's completely irregular, that's a good sign of citrus screening. A very good sign of citrus screening. Other ones is like the, the fruit may not develop all the way, the bottom of it might stay green, or it might be oblong shape compared to the usual, but the leaf discoloration is usually the best indicator of if you have citrus screening or not. You can send samples in to get tested, but I just kind of just assume you have it and just manage appropriately. So, because the reason we used to do the testing is our old recommendation was to cut down the tree. And you don't want to cut down the tree unless you have to. And that was purely to prevent the spread. But it's all over now. So, um, but anyways, I know that's all we have time for questions. But afterwards, you know, I'll hang around if you'll have any questions. So, thank you all um, for joining. I really appreciate it. Thank you.